So we will be discussing nervous and sensory system. As you can see here, the picture here of the brain is a stroke. So what is the nervous system? The nervous system is essential to sensory perception and the perception of pain and pleasure, control of movements, the regulation of movements, and the regulation of body functions, such as breathing. The body's most important and complex network, it is vital for the development of language, thought, and memory. And its center are the brain and spinal cord, which ultimately control all the nervous tissue in the other parts of the body. Its main parts are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord peripheral includes motor and sensory neurons now for what is neuron it is the functional unit of the nervous system it picks up signals in the one part of the nervous system and sends them to another where they may be relayed to other neurons or bring about some action just like contraction of muscle fibers so we have to three common types of neurons. The first one is the sensory neuron, which carry impulses from sensory receptors to the CNS. So they are called afferent and they are unipolar. The second one is the motor neuron, which carry impulses away from the CNS to effectors or the muscles and glands. And they, they are called efferent and multipolar. And the last one is the interneuron. So they are bipolar and they connect neurons together. For the neuron parts, we have the dendrites, which receive signals from other cells, the cell body, which organizes and keeps the cell functional, the cell membrane, which protects the cell, the axon hillock, which generates impulses in the neuron, and the node Ranvier, that allow diffusion of ions, the swan cell, which produces the myelin sheath, the nucleus, which controls the entire neuron, the axon, which transfers signal to other cells and organs, the myelin sheet, which increases the speed of the signal, and the axon terminal that forms junctions with other cells. So that is already understandable. Now we have the glial cells. The glial cells are non-neural cells that provide nutrients and materials used for neuron signal transmissions. So we have different glial cells, but as an example, we have the astrocytes, which are the star-shaped glial cells in the brain and spinal cord. So they function as axon guidance and synaptic support to the control of the blood-brain barrier and blood flow. So some glial cells include the swan cells, the oligodendrocytes, and the microglial cell, epididymal cells. Nerves are neurons that are bundled together, surrounded by connective tissue. This arrangement of the nerve provides a structured pathway that supports the electrochemical nerve impulses transmitted along each of the axons. These nerve impulses or signals are transmitted through action potential and the synapse. How is the signal transmitted? Neuron sends electrochemical messages across the cell called action potentials. So basically, action potential happens within a neuron from dendrite to axon terminal. Action potential works by polarizing a cell or a neuron. Being polarized, the electrical charge on the outside of the membrane is positive where the electrical charge on the inside of the membrane is negative. They set up this polarization through sodium potassium pump, which is a form of an active transport. And when the ion channels are open, which is caused by the stimulus reaching a rusting neuron. As this happens, the neuron goes from being polarized to being depolarized. In depolarization, positively charged ions rush into the inside of the cell, making it more positive. Then, we can now send a message. When the message goes to another neuron, it goes through a gap called the synapse, where a message is sent as chemicals called neurotransmitters, which will be discussed later on. The message can be excitatory, which means in simple terms, the messages will be passed on continuously, while in inhibitory, the messages are stopped from a neuron and cannot proceed. Action Potential Electrochemical message of neurons, an all or none phenomenon like yes or no, the signal is varied by changing the frequency. High hertz is strong stimulus. There are five phases. Stimulus, the stimulus starts the rapid change in voltage or action potential and patch clamp mode. Sufficient current must be administered to the cell in order to raise the voltage above the threshold voltage to start membrane depolarization. Phase 2. 
rising phase or depolarization. Depolarization is caused by a rapid rise in membrane potential, opening of sodium channels in the cellular membrane, resulting in a large influx of sodium ions. In our third phase, the falling phase or the repolarization. The membrane repolarization results from rapid sodium channel and activation as well as a large efflux of potassium ions resulting from activated potassium channels. In fourth phase, the undershoot or hyperpolarization phase. Hyperpolarization is a lowered membrane potential caused by a efflux of potassium ions and closing of the potassium channels. And last, the resting state is when membrane potential returns to the resting voltage that occurred before the stimulus occurred. When a message is sent through the axon to another neuron, it travels in electrical impulses, temporary shifts in the proton gradient. In sodium potassium pump cycles, the sodium potassium pump uses active transport to move molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. The sodium potassium pump cycle, the first step, intracellular sodium ions bind the protein. The second step, protein become phosphorylated or in this step, phosphate is added. And at step 3, conformational change in the protein due to the phosphorylation ejects the sodium ions to the now accessible extracellular space. And step 4, extracellular potassium binds to the protein. And step 5, protein is deposphorylated or in this step, phosphate is removed. And last, the step 6, due to the deposphorylation, protein returns to original conformation and ejects the potassium ions intracellularly. The pump is now ready to start to the cycle again at step 1. Now for the sign up. For short, synapse is a junction between nerves. In this section, I will discuss the following, which is the types of synapse, which is the electrical synapse and chemical synapse. Next is the neurotransmitter, and next is the postsynaptic potentials. In electrical synapse, it points where ionic currents flow directly across a narrow gap, gap junction from one neuron to another, or means no lag. Now for the chemical synapse. It has three elements. First is the presynaptic neurons. Second is postsynaptic neurons. Third is synaptic cleft. When we say presynaptic neurons, it brings action potentials toward the synapse. When we say postsynaptic neurons, it carries action potentials away from the synapse. When we say synaptic cleft, it is a small gap between the two neurons. Now for the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers in the body. It carries the message of the nerve impulse across the synapse. It is released into the synapse and bind with receptors. It causing ion channels to open in the new cell. Each neurotransmitter attaches to a different receptor. For instance, a dopamine molecules attach to a dopamine receptor. This one is, a, is an example of neurotransmitters in acetylcholine. There are three steps. First one is ion channels to open in the post synapse so that it, it can take in ions. Second step is ions come into the new or post synapse. Step three is AP continues on to the new cell. Now for the post synaptic potentials. When we say post synaptic potentials, it is whether to do or don't send an action potential. There are two um, types of this which is the excitatory synapse and inhibitory synapse. When we say excitatory synapse, it is chemically gated sodium channel opened by a neurotransmitter. When this synapse is opened, sodium rushes in and an action potential begins in the new neuron. For short, it is a do. Second is inhibitory synapse. It is a chemically gated potassium channel. When this is opened, potassium ions leave the cell, which increases the negative charge and inhibits the start of an action potential. For short, don't. Example is a GABA. A GABA is an acid or a Y-amino butyric acid. This is an inhibitory negative neurotransmitter that attaches to a protein in your brain known as GABA receptor. This GABA produces a calming effect. This can help with feelings of anxiety, stress, and fear. 
So to review the lesson, neuron sends message across the cell called action potentials, it works with polarization of the cell, and when the message goes to another neuron, it goes through a gap called the sign. A message is sent as chemicals or called neurotransmitters, and the message can be excitatory or inhibitory. Spinal cord is a neural tube that begins as an ectodermal neural groove, then becomes a hollow neural tube which is protected by the vertebrae. Function is to access a two-way conduction between the brain and the peripheral nervous system and to control simple reflex action. And speaking of reflex, yeah, the reflex are a very fast motor response to a stimulus. The sensory neuron bring information and passes the information directly to the motor neuron, the brain. It is a complex organ that controls thought, memory, motion, touch, motor skills, vision, breathing, temperature, hunger, and every process that regulates our body. There are three basic parts, the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. So this is the comparison of vertebrates that shows the relative sizes of particular brain regions. The hindbrain or the rhombinocephalon consists of metencephalon and myelencephalon. Metencephalon contains pons and cerebellum. The myelencephalon contains a medulla, tumbungata, and brainstem. Pons connects the medulla and the cerebellum to other brain regions. Cerebellum, balance, posture, and muscle coordination. Medulla oblongata, continuation of the spinal cord. Brainstem connects the rest of the brain to the spinal cord. Breathing, swallowing, digestive process, heartbeat, and diameter of the midbrain or the mesencephalon. Mesencephalon consists of tectum, tegmentum. Uh, tectum, auditory and visual reflexes and tegmentum contains a network of nuclei responsible for many vital actions, including arousal, consciousness, sleep-wake cycles, coordination of certain movements, and cardiovascular control. The forebrain, the prosencephalon, the largest basic part of the brain in humans, plays a central role on processing of information related to complex cognitive activities, sensory associative functions, and voluntary motor activities. It consists of diencephalon and telencephalon. The diencephalon contains the thalamus and hypothalamus. The telencephalon contains the cerebrum. The thalamus is a major site of sensory processing. Sensory information is received from the sensory nerves processed in the thalamus and sent on to the cerebral cortex. The hypothalamus, the hypothalamus integrates internal activities such as body temperature, blood pressure, respiration, heartbeat, and also controls the pituitary gland, the cerebrum, a control center of the brain. Right and left halves called cerebral hemispheres. There are four divisions, basic divisions at least. Frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital. Frontal front is for voluntary movement, expressive language, and for managing higher level executive functions. The temporal, auditory information, auditory, audio, parietal, sensory form information, occipital, the visual processing areas, vision. For the peripheral nervous system, it is the communication network between the CNS and the body parts. So it is subdivided into two, which includes the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is also subdivided into two, which include the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. For the somatic nervous system, it innervates the skeletal muscle. So it involves the voluntary muscles. So movements like walking is, is done through the somatic nervous system. For the autonomic nervous system, it innervates smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. So these are involuntary. So movements like heartbeat, blood pressure, heart uh, breathing rate and blood flow autonomic nervous system is responsible for that so it works to maintain our homeostasis so it is divided into two the sympathetic nervous system which is the fight or flight and the parasympathetic nervous system which is the rest and digest so these two nervous systems uh, that is seen when we encounter dangers like for example when someone is about to faint he can feel increase in blood pressure heart rate breathing rate and blood flow so that changes in his body is caused by the sympathetic nervous system as a flight mode however the recovery mode in which his uh, body conserves energy and the heartbeat slows down the breathing rate 
um, slows down also and it, prom it promotes digestion that nervous system responsible for that is the parents parasympathetic nervous system so to further learn about that we have here the diagram which shows the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system so first we have this sympathetic so let's go for the sympathetic first it shows dilate pupils so notice when someone has fainted the doctors look at its pupils if there is any changes like dilation so that is a sign that the sympathetic nervous system has done so it inhibits salvation it increases our heartbeat it relaxes the airways it inhibits activity of the stomach it inhibits cold water it inhibits activity of the intestines it secretes epinephrine and noriperiphrine and relax the bladder so that are the signs or the things that the sympathetic nervous system does in our automatic nervous system and the parasympathetic part we have the constrict pupils does it stimulate saliva it slow heartbeat it constrict airways stimulate activity of stomach stimulate cold bladder stimulate activity of the intestines and contract bladder now for the review we have the central nervous system which is composed of the spinal cord and the brain so so the central nervous system coordinates information and directs responses in our nervous system while the peripheral nervous system is subdivided into somatic and autonomic the autonomic is involved in our voluntary actions such as walking and our autonomic nervous system is involved in our involuntary actions just, such as heartbeat and blood pressure. Evolution of nervous systems. Its theory of origin. As the metazoans, multi-celled organisms developed, entire groups of cells probably tended to move toward favorable conditions. And when the number of cells became very large, a system of internal communication, in effect, a nervous system developed. There were two general types of nervous systems developed, the diffuse nervous system and the centralized nervous system. Diffuse nervous system has nerve cells that forms an extensive network throughout the organisms. Usually beneath the outer epidermal layer, this network is called nerve net. This type of nervous system is generally found in edarians, which includes hydroids, jellyfish, sea anemones, corals, and intanipores or calm jellies. As what we are familiar with, the mentioned organisms do not have brains. Even though they don't have brains, they are still able to move or function since they still possess neurons all over their body. Nerve net is a mesh-like system of individual and separate nerve cells and fibers dispersed all over the organism. The image shown is an example of a nerve net, nerve net of a hydra. Nerve net is the simplest pattern of invertebrate nervous systems. Shown here is a sea star which have a nerve net in each arm connected by radial nerves to a central nerve ring. Centralized nervous system. It is the integration of neurons that are collected into central integrating areas rather than being randomly dispersed. And it is evident in cephalized animals, in simple term, animals with heads. Thus, these animals contain brains. Annelids have a bilobed brain or a double nerve cord with sig segmental ganglia which are clusters of neurons. These ganglia connect to the central nervous system and make up a peripheral nervous system. Mollusks generally have three pairs of well-defined ganglia. In cephalopods, which is a group of mollusks, their ganglia have developed into complex nervous centers with highly developed sense organs. Arthropod, resemb arthropod resembles mollusks, However, ganglia are larger and sense organs are better developed. In arthropods, such as the grasshopper, the brain is divi divided into specialized areas, including the protocerebrum, which controls vision, and the deutocerebrum, 
which processes antenna signal, while their stomatogastric system regulates digestion. In vertebrates, the central nervous system consists of a brain and a dorsal spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system connects to the central nervous system. Compared to the invertebrates, vertebrate nervous systems are more complex, centralized, and specialized. While there is a great diversity among different vertebrate nervous systems, they all share a ba basic structure, a CNS that contains a brain and spinal cord and a PNS made up of peripheral sensory and motor nerves. One interesting difference between the nervous systems of invertebrates and vertebrates is that the nerve cords of many invertebrates are located ventrally, which refers to the front of the body, whereas the vertebrate spinal cords are located dorsally, which refers to the back. For a review, as the metazoans, multi-celled organisms develop, entire groups of cells probably tended to move toward favorable conditions. And when the number of cells became very large, a system of internal communication, in effect, a nervous system developed. There are two general types developed, diffuse nervous system and centralized nervous system.